I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Tyler Noble. I'm one of the joint replacement surgeons at Ortho SC. Um, I practice primarily out of the Conway location. I also hold office hours down in the um, new um, the new location at Market Commons as well. I'm usually the, there every other Thursday, so um, I can be um, have appointments down there as well as up at the um, at the Conway location. So as you can see, the point of the talk today is about joint replacement and specifically hip and knee replacement is uh, my specialty. And so as the title says, stop living in pain. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what joint replacement entails, some of the advances that joint replacement has come by. Um, there's probably very few people um, attending this webinar who um, either, who don't um, know somebody, um, who has already had a joint replacement, or maybe you've had a joint replacement yourself and um, having issues with it and you know, looking for, looking for some um, advice about that. So any, any situation you might be in, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that might arise. So let's go ahead and get started. So a little bit about my background. I grew up in Southwestern Virginia, in Blacksburg, Virginia, in the, in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, and so I went to Virginia Tech as my undergraduate, so I was able to stay local. And what do you know, I also went to medical school right there in Blacksburg at the uh, Via College of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, after I did my um, uh, medical school, I went up to um, South Central Pennsylvania and I did my orthopedic residency at uh, York Hospital, which is about 45 minutes north of Baltimore. I did quite a few rotations in Baltimore City as well. Um, and then after I completed my five-year residency, I did a joint replacement specific fellowship down in Tampa, Florida, um, at the combination fellowship between Tampa General and Florida Orthopedic Institute. Um, and so in 2016, or I guess 2017, I started with what was at that point Coastal Orthopedics, and now we have um, since all merged into Ortho SC. Um, and like I said before, I primarily practice out of the Conway location, um, but do also see uh, clinics in um, the Market Common location. So a little bit about me as to um, my interests, obviously family. Um, I've got uh, three beautiful children, and um, my wife is very patient with having a husband as an orthopedic surgeon. Um, actually, when I was in high school, I started doing some uh, woodworking in, in cabinetry for my neighbor. He actually had a fine um, a woodworking shop and was a cabinet maker. And so I learned quite a bit working with him. And I did that all the way really through, med or through medical school, uh, something that I still do to this day. I'm also an instrument rated pilot. And so flying um, is something that I'm very interested in. And I actually have a side business with some of my um, aviation friends where we actually build and um, design and, and produce hardware for the flight simulation industry. And I'm also a, a musician. I play several instruments and uh, enjoy singing. So here's me with my three children, my oldest son, Zachary, my middle daughter, Kaylee, and then my youngest one, Melanie. This is a vacation of us down in uh, Keough Island. And this is one of the projects I did. This is actually a, a fully functional Rubik's cube. It's about one foot on each side. It's a maple Rubik's cube and all the different colors are from granite um, inlays. Um, I was actually commissioned to build this for somebody and then when the price came back they, they backed out but it's okay because it's in my living room now and it's actually quite fun. Um, this is one of the kitchens that I that I um, built uh, with solid um, or the nice mahogany range hood and all inset uh, beaded face frame doors and um, then this is um, one of our simulators that we build. So Lots of uh, different interests and a lot of lot of uh, things that I have in my tool belt when it also comes to taking care of my orthopedic patients. So the point of this um, webinar, uh, we're going to give a background about arthri arthritis and joint replacement. We're going to talk about some of the treatment options for arthritis, a little bit about what's new in joint replacements, and obviously we'll answer any questions that might arise. So. Arthritis is an incredibly common problem, about 37 million, and this is an older slide, so with our population increase, it's probably quite a bit more than that, but if you look at the breakdown, it's probably about one out of every seven people, or one out of every three families have somebody that's affected by severe arthritis. 
So there's a couple different types of arthritis. Not all, not all aches and pains are the same. So you have osteoarthritis, which is the most common. And this is just a progressive degenerative kind of wear and tear of the joints. And when the cartilage between the bones starts to wear out and break down, then the bones start to rub together and cause inflammation and irritation in the joint. That is what we call osteoarthritis. And this is by far the most common. Um, inflammatory arthritis, there's several different types, most common being rheumatoid arthritis. And this is actually an autoimmune disease, meaning the body is attacking itself. So our body's immune system is attacking the joints and leading to rapid destruction of the um, cartilage. There's also um, you know, psoriatic arthritis, which is a type of inflammatory art arthritis. And this will typically be a cause of younger people having severe arthritis, uh, whereas osteoarthritis is more um, prevalent in you know, the 55 plus um, crowd. Post-traumatic arthritis is anytime you have a, a significant injury um, that uh, specifically a fracture that goes into the joint and then the altered mechanics as a result of that will lead to early degeneration of that joint. So it's a very multifactorial disease, meaning there's lots of different things that contribute to its um, um, development. And quite honestly, um, in with everything that we know in medicine, we don't completely understand all of the different uh, all the different factors that contribute to arthritis. There definitely seems to be a genetic component, um, but not entirely. There is also some overuse component, but at the same time, you see people that sit around on the couch all day with really bad arthritis, and people that run marathons don't get it. So it's not purely as simple as the the tread on your car tire analogy. Um, but then also your anatomy. So if you have abnormal alignment of your bones, that can predispose you to arthritis. So there is quite a lot of different things that go into it. So if you look at this picture of a joint, this is obviously a very simplistic view, but a, a well-functioning joint, you have smooth cartilage, it's well lubricated, it doesn't squeak or squeal when it moves, no pain and full motion, contrasting with a worn out joint where there's no lubrication, it's rusty, it squeaks, it's painful, cartilage is all worn out. This is um, a simplistic, although you know, not a completely unreasonable analogy when it comes to our uh, joints in our body. So arthritis is diagnosed um, primarily through history and x-rays, and then your physical exam findings are um, definitely um, there are characteristic physical exam findings that help us differentiate between arthritic causes of pain or non-arthritic causes of pain because um, there's a lot of situations where somebody has arthritis on their x-ray and their history is consistent with that, um, but it actually turns out that it's not arthritis causing their actual pain. So all three of these things are essential in getting the right diagnosis. So if we look at the actual knee itself, this is a normal x-ray of a knee. Um, if you look where my cursor is pointing, the space between the bones, where it looks like the bones are floating apart from each other, this is where the cartilage is. Now, cartilage does not show up on x-ray, and that's why it looks like the bones are floating apart. And so in this joint, you see nice, healthy joint space. Um, you don't see any bone spurs coming off the side, although everything looks nice and even. Now, if you um, look at this joint, on the other hand, the inside part here, the cartilage is completely worn out. It's bone grinding on bone. You can see how it's a really light color here. This means that there's really increased density of that, of that uh, bone as a response to the stress. And that's what we call sclerosis. So that's an x-ray finding. Um, and then also as the joint has collapsed here on the inside part, you can see how the, the, the shin bone, the tibia is actually falling over to that side, and that's causing this person to have a bow leg, you know, and so that can lead to the deformity that we see um, in um, somebody with bad arthritis. You also get these bone spurs that form off the side, um, and so definitely characteristic um, x-ray findings of arthritis, and when you look at those side by side, it's pretty easy to see the two differences. This is an artist's uh, depiction of what arthritis looks like, so the white 
is where the cartilage is. Normally, this should be nice, smooth cartilage, like a cue, like a cue ball, a pool cue ball. Um, but as it starts to break down, you have the exposed bone underneath, and that's what we call um, the um, the subchondral bone or the below cartilage bone. Now, when we're looking at a hip, this is a normal hip. The hip is a ball and socket joint, and so the ball of the hip is right here and the socket of the pelvis is right here. And then the space between the two is where the cartilage is, okay? Now, in an arthritic hip, all the cartilage is completely worn out. You've got these big bone spurs off the side. You see it's very uneven in here. That's because you have some areas of sclerosis again, that word. And then also you have some bone cysts. Um, both of these, all of these things are, um, um, characteristic of arthritis. Again, these are the side-by-side -side pictures. So when it comes to treating arthritis, um, the first step in helping somebody treat with their arthritis is educating them about what the condition is, the different things that they can do from a non-operative standpoint. Um, one of the biggest things is weight reduction. A lot of people don't realize that about um, nine times of your body weight goes through your knee, um, specifically the patellofemoral joint, the, the joint underneath your kneecap, um, when you go from a seated to a standing position. That's between the, the weight of your body and also the pull of your thigh muscles on that kneecap. So just a little bit of weight um, can translate into a significant loss of um, forces across that joint. Modifying your activities to try to find a good aerobic activity that is low intensity or low impact rather. So swimming, riding a bike or brisk walking. Um, there's different medications that you can take um, both prescription and over the counter. There's also lots of different injections. And then at the end of this list is when we start talking about surgical treatments. Um, so overweight women um, was one study found that they're four times more likely to develop knee arthritis um, and overweight men are about five times more likely. Um, and just losing 11 pound weight loss drops your risk of knee arthritis up to 50%. So that's a pretty significant um, finding right there. So when we talk about activity modification, this is um, a, you know, what I was talking about. Water aerobics is one of, the, one of the best things that you can do for your joint to get your heart up, um, but also decrease the forces across that joint. Um, other things include elliptical machines, a, a bicycle, um, uh, lap swimming, things like that. When it comes to medications, there's over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, what we call NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and uh, this is your Motrin, ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil. Tylenol is not on here. And a lot of people are confused to think that Tylenol arthritis is different than regular Tylenol. It's not. It's actually just a different dosage. And that's actually just a clever marketing scheme that um, the people of Tylenol came up with. Um, Tylenol is a pain reliever, but it actually doesn't have any anti-inflammatory properties. Um, when it comes to um, these anti-inflammatories, the problem with them is they can cause some gastrointestinal upset um, at higher quantities. They can cause problems with your heart. And also they are cleared by your kidneys. So they have to be taken very carefully um, in people that have any type of kidney impairment. Um, and a lot of times people with any kidney impairment shouldn't take them at all. Um, and so because of that, they're really best for short-term use um, or if you're trying to delay surgery in, in younger people where they're not a good candidate for joint replacement. The uh, um, prescription strength anti-inflammatories have the same efficacy basically as the over-the-counter ones except they usually have um, a little bit less um, gastrointestinal side effects. Um, if you guys remember the, um, the drug um, Vioxx that was pulled from the market, that's um, similar to uh, Celebrex and Meloxicam, but in that particular drug, they found an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular problems in people that had recently had heart attacks, so that's why the FDA pulled it. Um, so these medications can be good in people that get upset, um, you know, GI or gastrointestinal upset with regular anti-inflammatories. Um, cortisone injections. Um, these are when an anti-inflammatory is injected directly into the knee to flood the inside of the knee with a potent anti-inflammatory. 
The problem with a, a cortisone injection is that the first time you get it, it usually works really well, about you know three to six months or more. Um, but inevitably, just like any drug, your body will get used to it. And also the arthritic process will continue to progress. And also the last part is that the cortisone itself can actually soften the cartilage. So it can speed up the progression of arthritis. So when we're talking about cortisone injections, it's kind of a counterintuitive thought that you're giving somebody an injection to help with their arthritis, but it can actually be worsening the arthritis. And the argument to that is that if, if your pain is so bad that you're considering surgery, but the cortisone injections can, can, can prolong the time before you need to have surgery, well, the joint would be replaced anyway. So even if it softens the cartilage and causes the arthritis to get a little worse faster, it would still prolong the time before you need surgery anyway. But because of that, this is why we don't offer cortisone injections to young people. And that's also why you really shouldn't have more than three or four cortisone injections per year, uh, because more than that can cause problems. Then we have the gel injections, um, or they used to be called the rooster comb injections. Um, this is a synthetic joint fluid uh, that goes into the joint to cause a real slippery, um, uh, basically um, a real slippery surface between the bones to help them glide past each other a little bit more easily. Now, when I give these injections, I will also usually do it with a, a half dose of cortisone because what that can do is it'll, it'll kind of have the, the best of both worlds. Um, and people usually tend to do a lot better with the, the gel injections with a little half dose of cortisone at the same time. PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. This is where you take somebody's blood, you process it to take out um, certain growth factors um, and inject it back into the body. There is good evidence that it helps. Um, and it's probably a, one of the better situations for younger people, you know, the um, younger than 50 crowd um, who are having arthritis because it doesn't have some of the negative effects that cortisone can. When it comes to different um, supplements you can take, the glucosamine, chondroitin, um, there's a lot of people that swear by this. Um, there's really been no study that demonstrates that it has any efficacy. Um, it's certainly not going to hurt anything. Um, and if people are not, uh, people don't mind paying for them because they can be pretty expensive, you know, it certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't hurt anything. But again, there's really no evidence to say that it makes a big difference. So that's why I don't recommend it to my patients. And so surgery is the last um, uh, surgery is the last thing on the list. And we're talking about relieving pain, improving mobility, and getting you back to the enjoy, uh, the enjoyment of um, your day-to-day -day activities. So this is a graph looking at joint replacements in the United States. And so on the left, you have 2003. Uh, you can see how many hip and knee replacements were done in the United States and then project it out to 2030. And you can see how many more um, surgeries are projected to be performed in that 27 year time period. Um, and this is for a couple different reasons. Obviously the, the, most, you know, the most intuitive one is that there's you know, population growth and there's gonna be more people that need these surgeries, but also as the surgeries itself becomes more widely uh, accepted, People are much more willing to have the surgery done because they've seen so many friends and neighbors who've had it and done so well. And so when it talks about whether you should have the surgery, um, if you have somebody, if your family's telling you to have it or if your friend had it and did a good, uh, had a good result, um, or if you just you know, want me, your doctor to say that you need to have it or you wanna have it before your knee gets too bad, you know, these are all bad reasons to have, have uh, knee replacement or hip replacement surgery. Really, when it comes down to it is if you're having hip or knee pain that is affecting you enough to be um, uh, so that you are not enjoying your recreational and daily activities and you can't do the things that you need to do and want to do. And if you understand the, the risks and are willing to go through the recovery process, well, then they, yeah, you would be a good candidate for a hip or a knee replacement. So let's get into actually what a knee replacement is. So when we're talking about a knee replacement, a lot of people think that we just cut out the knee and put in a new one, just like putting a, a new motor in your car. Um, but it's actually quite different than that. And it's a little bit, a lot of people are, are pleased to find out that it's, it's not quite that barbaric. 
really all we're doing is we're resurfacing the ends of the bones. So we're just taking a very thin layer of bone off of the end of your thigh bone called your femur and a very thin layer of bone off of the top of your shin bone called your tibia. And then we attach these metal parts right here. This piece gets attached to your femur and this piece gets attached to your tibia. And then in between those two metal pieces, you have this smooth plastic dish. So instead of the bone grinding on bone that you see over here, now you've got nice smooth metal gliding on plastic. So the steps of a knee replacement is, like I said, you shape the ends of the bones to accept these metal pieces. Um, we, through the way that we um, remove the, um, with our bony resections, we can restore the alignment of your leg. If some of the ligaments are tight or loose, we can um, adjust um, we can adjust the way that the parts are positioned and we can make sure that everything is balanced nicely. And then we uh, fix the pieces or the, the metal parts to the bone using what we call bone cement, um, which is actually a form of plastic. It's actually mechanic or molecularly um, identical to plexiglass. It's called polymethyl methacrylate. So there's three different compartments of the knee. Um, you have the inside or what we call the medial compartment, the outside, the lateral, and then underneath the kneecap is what we call the patellofemoral compartment. So that's one, that's two, and that's three. Um, the last type of knee replacement, and I'm actually a, a big fan of what we call a partial knee replacement or a uni, meaning one compartment knee replacement. Um, this is a situation where you are just replacing the inside This is where you're just replacing the inside part of the knee. Now, a large percentage of the time, the inside or medial compartment of the knee is the one that wears out first. And if that's the case and the outside part of the knee and underneath the kneecap are still in good shape, doing this partial knee replacement actually has quite a, quite a bit faster recovery um, because you're not disturbing nearly as much of the knee. The knee feels much more natural because you leave the, both the ACL and the PCL, those are the sport ligaments that attach on the inside of the knee that have to come out with a total knee replacement. Um, and people tend to do um, really well with this, but uh, the obviously people will only do well with this if they're a good candidate for it. And so you have to have purely isolated arthritis just to the inside part of your knee. So now we can move on to hip replacement a little bit. Um, when we're talking about hip replacements, the, this is the picture that I showed you before with the worn out hip joint. Um, with a hip replacement, what we do is we remove the top part of the bone where we will then place this metal stem that goes down the inside of the bone and there's a special coating on that stem so that the bone will actually grow into it. And then on the top of that stem, we put a, a very smooth ball um, and then we shape the socket to accept a metal shell that gets impacted into the socket. And then on the back side of that socket, there's a real rough surface that the bone will grow into as well. And so then instead of the bone grinding on bone of your hip, you've got a nice smooth ball and socket joint. Now there's lots of different ways to do a hip replacement. Um, and the um, preferred um, approach for hip replacement that I do is what we call the anterior approach. And the benefit of that is the, um, uh, we do the surgery from the front so we don't cut any of the muscles. We just go down between the muscles and um, it uh, makes for a much faster recovery. And it also has some other benefits. Um, intraoperatively, we're able to use an X-ray machine. So we're able to get the parts positioned exactly the way we want them. And also we're able to get your leg lengths lined up properly. And um, then from a post-operative standpoint, um, the risk of a hip dislocation, that's where the ball pops out of the socket, is significantly lower when you do surgery through the anterior approach. Many, many multiples lower than a traditional posterior approach. So the steps of a hip replacement, you remove the normal bony head, you uh, shape the socket, then you place the stem down the inside, and Based on where this stem is positioned within the bone, that controls the length of the leg. 
And then also there's, we have the ability to put different length heads on this stem so that we can um, lengthen or shorten the leg by um, uh, that way. So when we're looking at some of the advances in hip replacements, um, come quite a long way. And the original hip replacements were actually what we call a hemiarthroplasty, or just a partial hip replacement. And in this one, this is actually an acrylic partial hip replacement for somebody who had had a uh, fractured hip. Um, and this is back, I believe this is from the 1940s or 50s. This is one of the earlier um, total hip replacements. And if you look at these, you can kind of get the sense that we, for a long time, we had a, a difficult time making sure that the parts would stick to the bone. Okay, so if you look at this device here, one of the big problems that we had for a long time was that the socket would come loose. And so with this one, basically, there was this great big screw that went all the way up the inside of the pelvis. Um, and um, that, I'm sure it was pretty stable, but good grief, that looks like a pretty uncomfortable surgery. Um, so it really wasn't until um, John Charnley, who was a British uh, hip replacement surgeon, came up with what he called the low friction arthroplasty of the hip. And he found that with a polyethylene liner, which is still what we use today, it's very, it's processed quite differently. So it's much more, um, uh, it's much more robust now, but with a very small uh, ball, uh, he was able to get very long-term wear rates with his hip replacements. And actually when I was in um, fellowship, I'd, I saw you know, two or three people with a uh, John Charnley hip that was about 30 or so years old. So there are still some out there. They're getting far and few between at this point, but um, it was a, really the first successful long-term arthroplasty. And so what um, probably the biggest thing that has changed with regards to hip replacement, as far as the technology of hip replacement, is what we call the bearing surface, and that's the actual joint surface. Now, the traditional type of hip replacement is what we call metal on polyethylene or metal on plastic, and that's with a metal ball and a plastic liner that clips into this metal shell. Now, that's a really great hip replacement, and the way that we tr uh, process our plastics now um, with that hip replacement, we're expecting about a 20 the 25 year life expectancy. Um, there's another, um, what I prefer is a ceramic on plastic. So ceramic is a almost a, a type of glass. So it's molecularly similar to glass, but it's not, um, it's not brittle like glass in the sense that it's gonna shatter. Um, and the difference between a ceramic head and a metal head is that on a microscopic level, um, metal has these little teeny tiny spikes on them that can over time cause the plastic to wear. Um, and the ceramic head is a much smoother surface, even on a molecular level. And so the long-term wear rate of a ceramic on polyethylene hip is really very good. Um, you've all may have heard about the metal on metal hip. Um, this was a big problem back in really 2007, 2008, there were a lot of metal on metal hips going in. And it was a great idea at the time because young people having to have a hip replacement for whatever reason, um, with the traditional plastic parts, you know, those, those hips were only lasting about 15 years or so. This is before we realized how to process the plastic to really make it last a long time. And so we decided that if we tried a metal on metal hip, this would prolong the wear. And it was very, very true that there was almost no wear at all between these two parts. But what we didn't count on was it, it generated a tremendous amount of metal ions, specifically cobalt and chromium, that some people had an allergic response to and it caused all sorts of other problems. So needless to say, we don't do metal on metal hips anymore. Um, when it comes to Joint replacements in general, um, our patient education has improved a lot. Um, so we have joint seminars like this. Um, also, before your surgery, you come to the hospital or the surgery center, wherever you're having it done, and, and we talk about what to expect and both before 
during and after the surgery. Um, there's aggressive rehab specifically for knees, hip replacements, especially when we're doing the anterior approach, don't need any specific therapy. Um, but we also have a multidisciplinary team um, to help from obviously, you know, the surgeon to the therapists to the ancillary staff, everybody is here to make sure that you have a great experience and a good outcome. Um, and we've also learned quite a bit about pain control to try to minimize the amount of narcotic medications you need um, while keeping the experience um, uh, as pleasant for you as possible. So when we're talking about getting ready and leading up to surgery, um, uh, people or patients will need what's called a medical clearance. And this is usually done either by the, um, the internist at the hospital or sometimes your primary care um, doctor will give you your medical clearance. And this is just to make sure that you don't have any major medical problems or any concerns that we need to think about when, um, as far as surgery goes. Um, you'll meet with the physical therapists, you'll meet with the anesthesia team, and we'll talk about um, everything to expect uh, when you get home, as far as whether your home is, is uh, set up properly to make sure that you don't have any um, risk of, of injury, falls, all of these things. So as far as what to expect leading up to surgery, um, when you leave my office, um, I make sure that I give you a, a booklet that has a, a, a lot of really great material um, to, to read through to give you a good sense of what to expect. Um, and that, uh, obviously, anytime if people have additional questions, they're happy to come and see me and, and, and make sure that all those questions are answered. Um, as far as the hospital stay, um, especially now that, um, you know, post COVID, we're really doing everything in our power to get people home the same day. And as crazy as that sounds, I would say about 75% of the time, we are successful in getting people to go home the same day, comfortably and safely. Um, and this is not because we're worried about um, you contracting COVID while in the hospital. It's actually very safe. Um, it's more an issue of um, of uh, preserving hospital, um, uh, making sure that the hospital itself is has beds available should they need it for uh, patients with COVID, uh, because they um, there's a completely separate wing of the hospital for for all those patients. So your actual exposure um, would be uh, very very unlikely. Um, but nevertheless, we are doing everything we can to get patients home the same day, and for the most part, everybody's very very um, on board with that. When it comes to um, your assistive devices after, um, you use a walker um, for the first one or two weeks, and then you transition to a cane. Um, and it's not uncommon, especially for, for hip replacements, um, for people to, to walk in to their two-week post-operative visit without a walker, maybe being on a cane at that point. I tell all my patients, it's not a competition. You don't need to do something. You just need to make sure that you're safe. Um, but as soon as you are safely able to get rid of these assistive devices, um, I, I certainly encourage people to do that. Um, for knees, aggressive early physical therapy to make sure that it moves and bends properly is really important. And then over the next one to three months, um, slowly progressing back to the, all the activities that you had your hip or knee replaced for in the first place. So this is just a little bit about all the different pain um, ways that we can treat your pain. Um, uh, one of the uh, um, a great improvement as far as joint replacements over the last five or so years is we're pretty much doing them all under spinal anesthesia these days. Um, so basically what that is, is we give you a um, medicine in your back to make you numb from the waist down. And then the anesthesia doctor gives you some medicine to make you sleepy, but you're still breathing on your own. <clears throat> and so you don't have to have a breathing tube. And the benefit of that is that when you wake up from surgery, you don't have the nausea and the grogginess or the sore throat from having the breathing tube. Um, it's, um, it's really a, a much better anesthesia experience than a, a general anesthesia. Um, so we pretty much talked about all of these um, preoperative, uh, the anti-inflammatory medications, um, intraoperative, you know, the different nerve blocks, the spinals. We have what's called a joint cocktail where we inject 
um, these medications into your knee um, or hip um, to help with um, your pain postoperatively. And obviously, it's a whole team involved in making sure that you have a, a great um, surgical experience and obviously a great post-operative outcome. Um, everybody from uh, me, your surgeon, to your therapist, your nurse case manager, the anesthesia doctor, and everything is obviously centered around you as the patient. Um, so coordinating the care at Ortho SC, we definitely spend a lot of effort in making sure that we make this process as um, seamless as possible. Um, we have now started using a new, um, uh, a new program that goes to your smartphone with um, reminders. And um, basically it's a, it's a much more personalized experience to make sure that, you know, and it also gives you an, a way of, of um, communicating with your care team easily. Uh, and patients um, are really excited about that. When we're talking about quality outcomes, this is a slide is a couple years old, but it's still um, true today. When we're looking at patients that are going home, being discharged home, as compared to going to a rehab facility or um, um, or staying in the hospital longer, um, this in 2018, 94 percent of our patients were going home um, as opposed to having to go to rehab as opposed to the national average benchmark of 84. So we were 10% above that. The average length of stay in the hospital uh, 2018 was 1 1.6 days. I would say that, that um, now we're probably 1.2, um, uh, quite, a, quite a bit lower. Um, whereas the national average for that was about three to four days. Um, obviously one of the biggest important things, probably the biggest complication for hip and knee replacements is infection. And it's a, it's a big problem if it happens. And so we'd go through great lengths to decrease that um, occurrence as much as possible. And so you can see back in 2018, when it comes to hip replacements, um, we had an infection rate of 0.35%. Um, we didn't have a single knee replacement get infected. And we didn't have a single shoulder replacement get infected. So these numbers are almost unheard of. And if you look at the national average, an average um, hip replacement is 1.5 infection rate, 2.5 for knees, and 2% for shoulders. And then another big problem um, with hip replacements is a dislocation where the ball comes out of the socket. Um, national average, 1.5%, whereas we were less than half a percent. Um, DVT is when you have a blood clot in your leg, um, 3% as opposed to zero. And a PE, which is a pulmonary embolism, where the blood clot leaves your leg and goes to your lung, this is a potentially fatal problem. The national average is 1%, um, and we were at 0.1%. So um, many, many magnitudes below the national average, which is still where we are today. Um, this is just an older slide. This just talks about patient satisfaction. I'm not going to go through all of them because um, it's a little bit of a busy slide. Basically, this says that for the most part, all of our patients we're very, very pleased with our, um, uh, basically the green line is um, the patients that we took care of compared to some of these other um, control groups. And so you can see in every single category, the green line was above the control group, except for this one, communication about medicines. And I do think we actually addressed that and we, we um, took that feedback and improved that communication. So in summary, um, hip and knee replacements are very successful surgeries, um, especially if, well, not especially, they're successful only if they're being done for the right reasons. And the right reasons are some life-limiting pain in the setting of severe arthritis. And if that is the situation that you're in, um, they have a, a very um, uh, reliable chance of restoring you to a very um, happy and fulfilled life. So again, the title of the webinar is Stop Living in Pain because we definitely have great alternatives to, to help. So at this point, I can um, take any questions that we might have. Let's see. So I have a question here. 
Um, it says, I was diagnosed with bursitis two years ago. Primary care provider recommended some exercises, but no improvement. Now I'm limping and have muscle atrophy. With um, COVID, I haven't been able to go to the gym. And will I require, sorry, will I require a replacement or another option? I want to return to my normal activities. Um, yeah, so bursitis, the, bursitis is an incredibly common problem. And I would say, quite frankly, about 75% of the time somebody comes in to see me for hip pain, it's actually hip bursitis or something similar to that rather than hip arthritis. Um, the problem with bursitis, and especially the person that wrote this post, I would caution you that if, if you have a problem that is diagnosed as bursitis for that long, the exercises aren't helping and you're limping, um, that could be an indication of actually some problem with the what's called the abductor muscles. Those are the muscles um, that stabilize your pelvis while you're walking. And so that would maybe be something that you would need to get um, evaluated for more specifically. Um, and that is usually, um, it's usually something that would require an MRI or some more advanced imaging to look into. Um, but yeah, bursitis, if it is truly bursitis, what I can say is that that is an incredibly um, common problem and it can oftentimes be very challenging to treat. Um, question number two, are appointments available at your market common office and is it easy to get in to see you? Um, yes, so I am seeing patients every other Thursday at market common um, and there's lots of different ways to, to get an appointment. You can either um, call um, uh, you can call our answering service or you can make appointments online. And we do offer same day appointments. Um, now I can't guarantee that I would have an appointment option availability as a same day, but we do um, definitely make sure that if people call and, and really need to be seen that day that we offer that. But I usually try to keep several slots open on my schedule um, for that very situation. So uh, the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, question three, with the hospital shutting down for surgeries, do you have your own surgery centers? Do you have a choice to use those instead? Um, yeah, so question number three, um, also yes. We've, um, Ortho SC, we do have several um, surgery centers around the area, um, one in Carolina Forest and then one down in Merrill's Inlet. Um, different providers work at different surgery centers, and so that is definitely um, options. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the numbers with, with COVID right now are such that um, the hospitals are not actually shutting down elective surgeries. We do feel that it is still safe to continue. And really the only re issue that, the, the reason that we would shut down elective surgeries, again, isn't because of patient safety as far as you know, people coming in for surgery. It's because we need to um, preserve hospital resources um, should the um, more COVID patients come in. So as of now, our hospitals are running very efficiently without any problems. Um, uh, do all ortho SC surgeons follow the same procedures when doing a knee replacement? Um, yes and no. Um, when it comes to knee replacements, the steps are pretty much all the same, but everybody, just like an artist, um, you know, if you, if you look at the, the painting of, of one artist versus another, it might be a picture of, you know, the same landscape, but it's going to have its different subtleties. And, um, but I will say that all the joint replacement surgeons at Ortho SC are very good. Uh, let's see. After a hip or knee replacement, how long am I? How long until I'm able to walk? Um, so yeah, um, with a hip and knee replacement, one of the greatest things about it is that we get you up that very same day. Really the only situation where we don't get you up the same day is if you're a surgery done later in the day. And if you had a spinal, sometimes it takes a little while for the medicine to wear off to where your legs wake up. Um, but for the most part, we get you up and get you walking right away. Um, after a total knee replacement, can you get down on your knee? Oh, that's a favorite question. And there's two things that people will oftentimes report as difficult or challenging after a knee replacement, one of which is being able to get down on your knees. Um, and there's two reasons for that. The first reason is that it just, it feels strange. It feels weird. Um, 
And sometimes it can be uncomfortable, not only because of the pressure on your scar, but also just because of the replacement itself. Now, there's no evidence to say that kneeling on a replacement causes any damage. And there are some protocols that I give my patients to help um, desensitize the knee. So usually it's a matter of kneeling on a soft surface like your bed, and then you, you transition to kneeling on a folded up towel, and then you kneel on a thick carpet, you know, and so you just basically you're stepping yourself down and then eventually you're kneeling on something harder. So that's usually the um, progression that, um, that I have my patients do. So my husband is scheduled for surgery in May for a hip replacement and we recommend, re recommend a patient manual for the daily routine at home. They mentioned that you should elevate your leg higher than your heart. Would you recommend a reclining chair. My worry is my husband is getting out of the chair. I did see the chair that tilts and they say it's easier to get out of the chair. Um, so swelling after a hip replacement is definitely something that can be problematic in the sense that, um, you know, different people's bodies will respond to surgery different ways. Um, and one of the, quite frankly, it's something that we see more, um, kind of a, a paradox, not a paradox, but it's kind of a counterintuitive that you do an anterior approach and sometimes people have a little bit more problems with swelling. And the reason for that is because people feel so good and then they get up and they're moving all around um, and that can actually lead to a little bit of swelling. Um, and so usually what I tell people is just let your body be your guide. If you get a little bit more swelling one day, that usually means that you overdid it. Um, and the um, um, if, you, if you listen to your body, that's the most important thing. And obviously when it comes to swelling, um, you wanna try to, uh, you, want, you do want to try to keep your, your legs elevated um, and you definitely want to make sure that you don't have any evidence of a blood clot, which is a concerning um, uh, cause of, of swelling. So I have a metal allergy, skin allergy to metal alloys. What metal is used in knee replacement surgery? So this is also kind of a controversial area. Um, there's a lot of surgeons that don't believe in metal allergy when it comes to knee replacement. Um, there is some evidence to support that patients with a really severe nickel allergy can have problems because there are some nickel, um, um, uh, there is a component of nickel in orthopedic implants, the standard orthopedic implants. Yeah, because our implants are an alloy of several different metals, cobalt, chromium, titanium, nickel. Um, and so patients that do have a metal allergy and we are able to, to um, show that they do react to that, specifically nickel. Yeah, we do have nickel-free options. Um, and in, in patients that have that, um, that request, I'm more than happy to use a nickel-free implant. Um, do you perform robotic knee replacements? What are the pros and cons for robotic? Yeah, robots are, are the exciting new um, wave in orthopedic surgery. I use robots quite a bit um, in my fellowship down in Tampa. Um, the, the pros of robotic surgery is quite honestly, and I don't say this to sound kind of jaded, but um, it's kind of a marketing thing because it's, uh, it's the cool, it's the latest and greatest and it's neat. Um, and when robots first were come, as robots are first coming out, there's still a lot of, um, there's still some learning curve associated with it. And there's no studies that have shown that the knees are doing a lot better. Now, I say that with a lot of caution because as the technology improves, I absolutely believe that robotic surgery will become the way that uh, you know knee replacements and hip replacements and all sorts of replacements are done in the future. Um, again, as that, as that technology is developed and improved and enhanced, um, there's not a single industry where robots were started to be used and then went back to humans. You know, so look at the assembly line of your vehicles, right? Every single automobile that rolls off the line is painted by a robotic arm. You know, and so I'm not saying that robots are bad, quite contrary. I, I, I um, really enjoyed using them in my fellowship and I thought it was a, a very good tool. I think you have to be careful going to a robotic surgeon um, because if somebody, if, if, if that particular surgeon is relying on the robot 100% um, and they don't have a good foundation of traditional knee replacement, 
they can get themselves in a little bit of trouble. And I actually did see that quite a bit. Um, some of the, the patients that have been referred to me from robotic centers, um, especially as people were first starting to learn the technology, um, you get some, some unfortunate um, problems that could arise from that. But um, a well-trained surgeon with a good foundation of, of fundamentals of, of um, joint replacement, I think robots are really um, the wave of the future. All right, do we have any other questions here? Do you do revision? Yes, I actually just did a revision today. Um, so revision means a redo um, surgery. So somebody who has had a hip or a knee replacement and still having pain or problems otherwise, then going back in and redoing that surgery is what we call a revision. So there's lots of different types of revisions from simple revisions, meaning you're just replacing the ball and liner on a hip replacement or replacing the plastic piece or like what I did today where all the, the parts come out and, of your knee replacement and put in completely new parts. You know, so there's all sorts of, all sorts of uh, different revisions that need to be done and um, everyone is a, a very uh, different situation. But yes, I do revision arthroplasty. Uh, let's see, hang on one second. How far are you scheduling out hip replacements? That is actually, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that I don't know. That's kind of the, my scheduler, but I believe last time I talked to her, I was about six weeks out. I usually schedule about six weeks out. Um, then the last question, um, 300 pounds, uh, five foot six, am I able to have knee replacements on both knees? So um, when it comes to any type of joint replacement, not necessarily knee replacement, one of the big things that we look at is what's called your body mass index or your BMI. And there's a lot of good evidence to support that doing um, elective arthroplasty in patients with a elevated BMI does cause a increased risk of complications. Um, so I haven't, um, I would have to calculate what uh, BMI was for 300 pounds and five foot six. Um, but uh, when it comes to knee replacements, I will usually, um, um, usually 42 is kind of my, my cutoff um, because I just feel it is not safe. Um, and it kind of, it does the patient a disservice more so than not doing anything because of the increased risk of problems. But um, it's certainly, it's, it's a very challenging, it's a very challenging problem um, that we do have other, um, we do have other treatments that we can um, offer, whether it's meeting with a nutritionist to try to help and get a diet um, uh, coordinated. Um, also, we, there's um, bariatric surgical options that people have had really good results with. Um, because what I tell my patients is you really only have one chance to do it right the first time. And if you have a problem with the first time knee replacement or hip replacement, and you have to go in and do a revision, then the, um, the chances of having a good, excellent outcome go down. So it's really important to try to maximize your, um, try to optimize yourself leading up to surgery. Another question. So after replacement, do I go right into physical therapy and does the market common office have physical therapy? So yes, on both accounts. So um, you don't wheel out of the operating room into the physical therapy place, but um, usually within, within the first three days after surgery, you have your first appointment. Um, and there is the option of doing home health physical therapy, but really our preference is to do outpatient physical therapy because there they have all of the equipment, they have the tools, and really going to a therapy place puts you in that environment where people are tend to, to kind of have more motivation to really push themselves. And I have seen that patients by and large will do much better with outpatient physical therapy. And yes, our market common office does have uh, physical therapy. All right. Well, everybody who chimed in um, asking questions, thank you very much. And hopefully this was beneficial. And like I said, at any point, um, if you have 
Um, any other questions or would like to come and make an appointment? I'll be happy to see you. I had one more question come in. It says, can you have both hips replaced on the same day? Um, <laughs> yes and no. So theoretically it is possible. Um, and there are some um, there are some situations where people have had that done. Um, I don't personally do that, not for any other reason that I, I care about my patients. And I think that would be it, having both joints, whether it's knees or hips, is just a very unpleasant experience. Um, not to say that I haven't done it either in residency or fellowship. I, I haven't done it in my own practice because I've seen that it can be pretty challenging. And it's um, I've actually had family members that had it done. And they said that they would never do that again, because quite frankly, you don't have a good leg to stand on. So usually um, I will separate um, my, my hip or knee replacements by about six weeks is the earliest I'll do. Um, and, uh, but honestly, most people, you know, um, most people when they spread it out about six weeks, they're like, yeah, I'm really glad that, glad we did it this way. And, and it's, a, it's a better way to do it in my opinion. Very good. Well, it looks like we finished up on time. So um, I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And, and uh, again, if you have any questions or would like to make an appointment, um, feel free to call up and we'll see you around. All right. Thanks a lot.